All right, I am uh, Dan Esty, professor here in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, as well at the Yale, as the Yale Law School. I am also the director of the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy that is a co-sponsor of today's program. I'm the former director of the Yale World Fellows Program that is the other co-sponsor of today's program. And it is a great pleasure to have with us today uh, four of the Yale World Fellows of recent vintage who have uh, insights on the environmental arena and uh, who are going to share with us their perspectives on the uh, road to Copenhagen and the prospects for a beyond Kyoto new climate change agreement. And uh, we do gather at an auspicious moment in that regard. Uh, it's about six weeks from now that the world's leaders will be in Denmark uh, hoping to put, or they had hoped to put, the finishing touches on a new climate change agreement. Uh, I will predict for you now that we will not get a full-blown new agreement uh, to go beyond the Kyoto Protocol. I think that's not a difficult prediction at this point, but it is um, a sad one. Uh, and I do think we want to ask our panelists today to comment on both the prospects for Copenhagen and what it would take to get uh, my prediction overturned, but also what Plan B looks like. Where do we go if we don't get to Copenhagen uh, with the prospects of a big new deal? By the way, I think we should all watch out for the prospect of um, there being a, uh, a kind of a, a happy face put on what comes out of Copenhagen. In fact, um, I like to tell the story of Morris Strong, who was the Secretary General of the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. And I was at the time working for the U.S. government and remember Morris Strong taking me aside and, uh, you know, I'd asked him what the outcome he expected was and he said there's only two outcomes possible when you bring so many of the world's leaders together. Uh, he said there's the possibility of success and the possibility of real success. And uh, I think when you do gather so many folks, it's uh, often the case that people want to declare success whether or not they have actually achieved it. And I suspect that will be the case in Copenhagen, but perhaps we can press our panel as well on what real success would look like uh, coming out of this negotiation in December. We have, as I said, a, a superb panel, uh, and I'm gonna introduce all four of them at the outset and then just pass the baton down the line here and give each of them uh, a chance to make an opening statement and then we'll really try to turn this into a conversation as quickly as possible with you all asking questions and you can ask uh, any one or all of the panelists to respond and we'll try to get some debate and dialogue going back and forth. So um, on my immediate left, uh, to the right as you all look at us, uh, is Sasha Mueller-Krenner. He is the Managing Director and European Representative of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, he has a past uh, set of experiences in the environmental arena that are both broad and deep. He uh, was one of the founders of the most important environmental think tank in Germany, the Ecologic Institute. Uh, he also served as the Boll Foundation's representative uh, for Europe, director for Europe, as well as the director for North America, which gave him a period of time based in Washington, D.C. Uh, he comes out of the Green Party politics in Germany and has spent a great deal of his life looking at not just German environmental issues, but global scale ones. So we'll welcome his uh, views in just a moment. Uh, next to Sasha is Tim Jarvis. Uh, he's an Australian and associate director of a company called URS based in the UK. And he works uh, in this regard as an environmental scientist advising developing countries on how to achieve sustainability, on how to manage their natural resources in an appropriate way, uh, how to deal with contaminated land, how to address the energy push that they're facing and the need for energy efficiency. He's perhaps even better known as an explorer. He's uh, been to both the North and South Poles uh, and has produced some extraordinary documentary films based on those uh, expeditions. Next to him is uh, Gidden Bromberg from Israel. Uh, Gidden is director of something called Eco Peace and also Friends of the Earth Middle East. He's had that role for uh, 15 years. And he is especially known for trying to bridge divides. Uh, it comes from a region where that kind of bridge building is critical, and he has done it with innovative methods looking at environmental issues and has built a network, not just in Israel, but across the Middle East, 
that is seeking to think about how to bring environmental progress and peace uh, and better understanding across countries. And finally, we have Vince Perez um, of the Philippines. Uh, Vince is a former energy minister of the Philippines. Uh, he was a banker in his earlier life. Uh, he is currently the chair of World Wildlife Fund Philippines and is also working today as a uh, CEO of a company called Alt Energy Partners, which is a renewable electric power company looking to build renewable energy projects across Asia. So a, a very interesting mix of perspectives, and I hope uh, hearing across these different viewpoints will get some illumination on the path to Copenhagen. So let me start with Sasha. Take it away. So do you have to push a button here? No, it's no. Everyone's, everyone's hearing me. So first, thanks to the, uh, for the invitation to you and to the program. And uh, I see this is an issue everyone seems to be interested in. I gave another talk this uh, uh, today about noon where there were as many people in the audience as we have on the panel here, something like that, on the German elections. But climate change seems to be something everyone wants to hear about. And, uh, but uh, you already summed it all up. The prospects, prospects for Copenhagen are are not as good as we would have wished for two years ago when we set out on the road to Copenhagen at the UN conference in Bali, 19, uh, 2007. And uh, I also think the alternative in Copenhagen is whether we will have, uh, have an agreement or whether we will have a good agreement. And this is in fact the danger that uh, uh, what we should be looking for is something that I would call an ambitious outcome. We probably will not get out of Copenhagen with a new treaty that will replace the Copenhagen, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, but we should get out with a political deal that puts us on a, puts us on a road towards such an agreement. And what I want to present here is a view from Europe, uh, also a little bit obviously a view from myself and the Nature Conservancy. And uh, what uh, the European Union wants in those negotiations is basically, well, fill the gaps of the Kyoto Protocol and uh, build on the elements of the Kyoto Protocol that should be retained. So filling the gaps of the Kyoto Protocol basically means two things. First, there should be uh, uh, new commitments for developed countries, especially for those developed countries that are not part of the Kyoto Protocol, and this is mainly the United States. Uh, Kyoto was ratified uh, uh, by a number of countries, but the biggest emitter worldwide, which is the United States, has not joined the Kyoto Protocol, and everyone in the EU agrees that uh, it does not make sense to negotiate a new agreement that does not include the US. And that points to the lack of political process here on the domestic front. There is no climate change legislation here yet in the United States coming out of Congress, and the US administration has made it perfectly clear that there will be no commitment of the US government in international negotiations before the legal basis here domestically has been, has been established to enter into a commitment, both for reductions but also for financial support for developing countries. But this is element number one, that we have new and stronger commitments for developed countries that at least get close to what signs what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, recommends uh, for us, and that's that in aggregate for all developed countries would have to be something like 25 to 40 percent greenhouse gas emission reductions by the year 2020 based on 1990 levels. So the second gap of Kyoto is not the US but it's that a lot of developing countries have ratified the Kyoto Protocol including the big uh, emerging economies like China, India, Brazil, Indonesia but without having any significant commitments going along with that. So a new agreement coming out from Copenhagen, Copenhagen that is the clear view of European governments has to contain, has to include uh, clear commitments for developing countries too. Those must not be fixed reduction commitments, nationwide, economy-wide reduction commitments like for the Europeans, the Americans, the Australians or the Japanese, but it must be something like staying uh, or staying in a quantifiable and measurable way under business as usual scenarios, which are, as you all know, outright scary. When you look at where the Chinese emissions are going, when you look at where forest emissions from Brazil and Indonesia are going, and so on and so forth. So there must be something quantifiable and measurable, measurable commitments coming from China, whether it's for the overall economy or whether it's at least for specific sectors. 
like in targets for increasing energy efficiency, the share of renewables, or for specific economic uh, sectors like the steel industry, the cement industry, and so on and so forth. And there is obviously a balance between what developed countries, what the EU will put on the table, what developing countries will put on the table. So what we want to retain from Kyoto is some of the political innovations. It's the first uh, legally binding uh, climate change agreement that we've ever had. It contains reduction commitments, at least for a number of countries, and this has established a number of interesting mechanisms to reach those reductions. For example, emission trading. It has not established a global carbon market, but it has uh, laid the ground for a number of emerging regional carbon markets. The European carbon market has been the first step. It's already working since several years. It's slowly being improved, and uh, the, the screws are tightened. But in a lot of other places, including cap and trade legislation that is being discussed in the US Senate right now, but also in Japan and Australia, carbon markets are slowly being established. And this is, a, uh, this is one of the key innovations of the Kyoto Protocol. And we want to retain the framework, the same for the clean development mechanism and other innovations like that. In addition to that, what we need to get out of uh, uh, Copenhagen very clearly is um, uh, we also have to include some of the elements that were not considered in, uh, in Kyoto. The first one is forests. Forests globally uh, contributes 20% to, to the emissions, uh, tropical deforestation especially. We have to include forests. They also have to be 20% of the solution. We have to include adaptation. This was not a big issue 15 years ago. It's now a major issue for the majority of countries at least especially for the least developed countries and small island states. And we have to take care of financing. All this will mean that a lot of money will flow from A to B, from developed to developing countries, for forests, for adaptation, for technology transfer. And that money, by the way, can only come out of global carbon markets. And by the way, when setting up cap and trade legislation here in the US, this is also something to look at, that the auctioning of the emission permits also generates those revenues. Well, you already said Copenhagen will probably not produce such an agreement. I agree. Nevertheless, to get to a political deal, a political declaration that then maybe sets a roadmap for the next six to 12 months after Copenhagen, still some hurdles have to be overcome. And there are not that many opportunities for world leaders to, to meet in the coming weeks and get those things done. And in fact, this can only be done on the leaders' level. This is nothing that can be sorted out on the diplomats' level or even by environment ministers, but only on the highest level, because there will be all those trade-offs with trade policy, economic policy, even foreign security policy considerations. So only heads of state can do that now. There is only one major opportunity where a critical mass of heads of state will meet, which is the APEC summit mid-November in Bangkok, so the Asian leaders will go there, Mr. Putin and Mr. Medvedev will go there, Mr. Obama. And European leaders have already announced that if the US and if others are willing to do it, they would do a leader summit before Copenhagen to cut that deal. So I hope this works out. Uh, there will be the European summit end of this week and immediately after the summit, Chancellor Merkel, re-elected today by German parliament for four more years, will go to Washington and give a speech to both houses of Congress so I hope she will come with a strong message from European leaders. She already has dinner with Mr. Sarkozy right now. So I hope they, they come in agreement here and uh, send a clear message from Europe to the US administration that we need this breakthrough on the highest level. And in closing, let me come back to, again, to the Morris strong quote that you were mentioning. So my, my scenario, my, my negative scenario is not that the negotiations will break down and this can happen. It can well happen that uh, developing countries in Copenhagen will say, well, considering that the US has not put anything on the table, we just walk out, or that uh, the African countries walk out. This is a scenario that is possible, although I don't think it's likely, because so much has been invested uh, into this summit. So many world leaders go there, and everyone wants to show a success at home. So the real danger is a cover-up. The real danger is that leaders will pass a non-binding political declaration without any substance, and that we will get into something like we have in the trade area with the Doha trade round, that since years we are pretending we're having international talks, but they lead nowhere, and what we're having in fact is a lot of bilateral deal-making, and the aggregated quality of those deals is much below what we would have had in a new trade regime, 
and what we will have in the climate regime, again, will be much below what we could have had as part of an international treaty and definitely below what we need as science tells us. Thank you. Sasha, thank you very much. And uh, with a provocative thought that a flaming failure would be better than a false success. Uh, I happen to agree with that. So it's uh, a point we should debate. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes before I go on to Tim. Any of you who are sitting on the sides or in the back, there are seats up front. Uh, please come take a seat if you'd like. Uh, we're eager to have everyone be comfortable. Um, second of all, we are recording this event today. Oh. So any of you who um, would not- you tell me that? <laughs> You're far from your home newspaper. But any of you who are, who are not interested in being recorded uh, should take this opportunity to depart. Otherwise, we have uh, presumed your acquiescence in, the, in being on film if you happen to have the camera pass by you. Uh, there will also be a reception outside afterward when we're done. Uh, we're going to run for uh, just about 55 more minutes and uh, hopefully cover a lot of ground in that time. So uh, we've had the European view. Let's get the view from down under and perhaps even more broad than that. Tim. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, I'm going to just talk very briefly about a little bit of background, what I've personally seen. I'm an environmental auditor, so I get to see things at the kind of pointy end of industry. In other words, what industry is putting up the stacks into the atmosphere. For my sins, I walk around in the polar regions uh, five times, three times to the South Pole and twice up north. So I get to see at the receiving end of the, of, of the uh, equation what's going on. And I also work in the aid sector in uh, Asia Pacific where I see you know, sea level rise and the threat of it is a real issue for a lot of the Pacific Island communities with whom I, with whom I deal. Um, very brief synopsis, uh, without going into the IPCC fourth assessment report with a very learned audience, uh, we have obviously a range of uh, CO2 emission scenarios with a corresponding uh, array of climate um, of temperature increase scenarios and a corresponding array of, of, of sea level rise scenario, so I'm not going to kind of go into, into those, but what I would say, in the context of the polar regions, you have three fundamental things going on up north. You have the melting of the Greenland uh, ice cap, which is contributing perhaps 250 cubic kilometers a year into the, uh, into the uh, global uh, sea levels. You have the melting of the Arctic sea ice, which if you're trying to walk to the North Pole makes things extremely tricky, given that you have to walk across that surface of frozen ocean in order to make that journey possible. Um, the, the impact that's having, uh, it's only 15 feet thick at the North Pole itself. The ice, in the event of its melting, along with the rest of the ice that covers the surface of the Arctic Ocean, you're going to end up with a lot more incoming heat, which currently is reflected back out into space, being absorbed by the, uh, the uh, ocean, the Arctic Ocean, and having a, a corresponding positive feedback on, on, on warming temperatures and disruption of global um, uh, circulations, uh, oceanic circulations and that kind of thing. The third thing you have happening up there, of course, is this massive positive feedback um, nightmare scenario of, of the, uh, the methane emissions from uh, Siberia, with methane being perhaps 20 times more uh, potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2, of course. And you've got areas the size of France bubbling away uh, up north. I spent a lot of time in, in Siberia, I've witnessed a lot of this kind of stuff myself firsthand. In terms of down south, um, the majority of Antarctica is not melting, however, the western Antarctic cap, which extends far further north than the, 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 the larger eastern cap, does, uh, does uh, or is experiencing a large number of, of problems. We've had a, a series of uh, fairly uh, cataclysmic losses of ice shelves and things like that, uh, Larsen B being the most famous example fairly recently, five or six years ago, and uh, it, it is a real issue there. And, and, and just to put things in perspective, the western cap on its own could raise global sea levels by seven meters with all of the uh, corresponding impacts on uh, population migration and disease and saline, uh, you know, salinity issues for freshwater aquifers and that kind of thing. So that's the sort of scenario of, as, as to what I've seen personally in the polar regions. In terms of trying to put more of a, uh, a tangible face to this idea of, of, of trying to restrict um, emissions to 450 parts per million, or more recently there's been a, a, a drive to restrict things to 350, with a view to getting a 2 degree C temperature cap. Um, to put that into more real terms, um, uh, I looked at the World Energy Council's uh, predictions as to what the total reserves of coal, gas and oil were currently, and the, the figure is around 800 billion tonnes of carbon equivalent stored in those reserves. Now, based on multipliers, if we were to burn all of that lot, we'd have about 3 trillion tons of CO2 uh, contributed into the atmosphere. 
If you look at a couple of reports in Nature recently, um, a report by a guy called Allen, he said really we want to be limiting our total carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere to about 1.8 trillion tonnes by the year 2500 in order to have any chance of, of keeping temperatures at, uh, temperatures at 2 degrees uh, C. A guy called Meinshausen said between the years 2000 and 2050 we really want to be keeping the figure at 1 trillion tonnes. Now given that we're putting 30 billion tonnes a year into the atmosphere as a global collective and we're already 10 years into Meinshausen's 50 year uh, time period we're already, unfortunately, well on the way to the unenviable uh, one trillion tons, about 300 billion tons into that one trillion. Now, um, most of the scenarios we have to try and reduce CO2 emissions, upon which um, the Copenhagen discussion will be the latest opportunity to talk about, um, don't get us anywhere near those kind of scenarios. Um, what I wanted to just finish on briefly is, is the kind of message that Australia and the UK, I wear two hats, I have two passports, Australian and British, what their respective positions on this situation, what the messages that that sends to the other people at the Copenhagen Conference. In the case of Australia, uh, Australia is the largest coal exporter in the world. Uh, by 2020, we will still rely extremely heavily on coal as our principal energy generating power source, about 75%. Uh, we expo export, as I say, most, most coal to China. We have virtually no solar uptake when you compare it with a country like Germany, who has a very, very good track record in the area of, of, of solar uptake. We have an extremely strong uh, coal body. We have a Labour government that was elected in basically on the back of a manifesto, a green manifesto. And thus far, we've put back our cap and trade scheme, not one year, but now two years. And we've moved uh, the baseline uh, date from which we're going to try and reduce emissions by from 1990 to the year 2000. So we're, we're looking now, instead of reducing from a 1990 baseline, we're looking at a year 2000 baseline. Instead of getting the scheme going in 2009, we're now pushing back to 2011. That's not, to my mind, the kind of message you want to send uh, when you're going into something like Copenhagen. Take the Brits. Uh, the Brits apparently have showered themselves in glory with this, this fantastic um, commitment to reducing CO2 emissions, the largest commitment that any country has made uh, by 80% of 1990 levels by 2050. But if you look at the reality of what's actually being achieved on the ground, uh, we're really well off track in, in terms of achieving anything significant. Um, if you look at the 12% reductions that the UK has so far managed to achieve against 1990 baseline, uh, the latest thinking is that perhaps a third of that is due to carbon credit purchase, uh, and perhaps a third of that is, is due to recessionary downturn and a natural, if you want to call it that, reduction in the amount of CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere because of an industry, industrial uh, downturn. In terms of um, uh, some of the institutional barriers, we have all sorts of great commitments, as I say, but, but when it comes to really rethinking, uh, for example, the introduction of, of, of a significant quantity of nuclear into the UK power mix, we only have 12 functioning nuclear power stations at the present time. Uh, eight of those are going to be offline in the early 2020s. We've spent a lot of time and energy trying to reduce the planning uh, time that it takes to actually get new nuclear uh, power stations up and running, which is a great initiative. But on the flip side, the Scots are not at all interested in having nuclear power stations in their home uh, turf. And we haven't really done the numbers properly in terms of what the cost would actually be to get these things up and running. And quite frankly, we're really running out of time to get a lot of those power stations up and running, commissioned, and producing electricity and putting it back into the grid to contribute to our CO2 reduction significantly by the year 2020. So uh, a lot of talk, but not, in my mind, a tremendous amount of action. Taking the recessionary, the nat natural recessionary losses out of the equation um, and the carbon credits out of the equation, we perhaps realized a 4% reduction um, on 1990 levels to where we're at currently. Now again, um, we're, we're not talking to, to uh, uninformed people at Copenhagen, they know exactly what the numbers are, even under the most basic analysis as to where the UK currently is. So we can't go in there all guns blazing saying, look, we're committing to 80% reductions in 1990 levels by 2050, what about you? Because unfortunately the numbers just, just don't add up. So from where I'm standing, um, I personally, personally am, am, am a bit ashamed of Australia's um, efforts uh, in this area. We are the, virtually the largest uh, excluding some of the, the, the small United Arab Emirates uh, countries, the largest per capita 
um, uh, emitter of carbon uh, in the world, certainly far higher than the US. Um, if we really expect uh, countries like India and China to come to the party, which they're not really legally bound to do, uh, we need to really be demonstrating some serious, um, some serious moves in the right direction in order to get them to want to, to want to change too. Thank you, uh, Giddon. So the picture is not pretty, and I'm about to make the pi the picture even less pretty because um, when you look at a failure, uh, uh, it's easy to do, I'm afraid. When you look at at the failure that Copenhagen looks like. Uh, that it will be presenting us, or the greenwash efforts. What does it mean on the ground? What does it mean to communities? What, it, what does it mean um, uh, to water scarcity? And the region that I come from, uh, the, uh, the fertile crescent of the Middle East, um, is very, 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 very worried as to uh, how climate change will act as a, a threat multiplier for a ready water scarce part of the world that uh, will likely lead to even more animosity and more conflict. Um, when we look at, uh, at the models um, uh, presented on rainfall and on uh, recharge of aquifers uh, due to changes in the climate, um, we see uh, increased dramatic uh, reductions both in quantities of water, uh, quantities of uh, the amounts of, preci of uh, precipitation, that falls in uh, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean coast, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, Syria, Lebanon, um, uh, as, as areas that we're focused on. But even more importantly, the way that the rain will fall, um, rather than uh, 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 a week of uh, several rain events, um, one dramatic rain event that will lead to a torrent, to a flood, it basically um, uh, uh, allows the water to rush off to the sea and not recharging the groundwater. The most important source of water in our very dry part of the world is, gr <coughs> excuse me, is groundwater and not surface water. And uh, climate change threatens, according to some of the models, to uh, decrease recharge of groundwater for up to 70%. Um, uh, uh, also, the rising sea level of the Mediterranean uh, threatens the groundwater again because of seawater uh, sea uh, intrusion into the groundwater, the groundwater of the coastal aquifer uh, shared by uh, Israel and Palestine, and rising uh, uh, water levels of the Nile Delta, flooding uh, uh, large sections of the Nile, a half a meter rise uh, causes some three uh, million Egyptians to lose their homes, to lose their livelihoods. A meter rise uh, is somewhere between six to eight million Egyptians will lose uh, their homes and their livelihoods. What does increased water scarcity mean as, par uh, as per uh, po uh, political insecurity or increased insecurity? Well, it, it makes it so much more difficult uh, to reach peace agreements um, uh, where peace agreements don't exist vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel and Syria. Uh, Israel and Lebanon. The Litani River currently flows into the Mediterranean. Uh, predictions of climate change uh, uh, present models where the Litani will no longer flow. The Litani in Lebanon will no longer flow um, uh, into uh, the Mediterranean. There will be not enough water. Uh, rising sea levels means that Palestinians in Gaza, who are already drinking water unfit uh, for uh, human consumption because of over extraction because uh, they're denied other sources of water um, will have even uh, uh, worse water to drink because of the increased salinization of that water with the rise of the Mediterranean. Um, less precipitation, less groundwater means uh, that economies in Palestine and Jordan that are, d are more dependent on agriculture, some 30% of GDP uh, for uh, 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 comes from agriculture for Palestinians. Um, that's largely dependent on rain-fed agriculture. Well, that goes, um, uh, creating more instability um, uh, in Palestine. For Jordan, although its contribution to GDP, um, uh, agriculture uh, is not so significant, it's very important for the stability 
of, uh, of the kingdom. And that's where the loyalty base of uh, King Abdullah comes from. It comes from the rural communities. They're all dependent on the groundwater and the rainfall that climate change is going to dramatically uh, decrease. So um, a real uh, threat uh, uh, to uh, water security and uh, to uh, implications not only for our own part of the world but globally because as we've seen that increased, that continued insecurity and hostility and uh, violence and animosity in the Middle East uh, uh, so alarmingly spreads to the rest of the world. Um, the answer for uh, the wealthier uh, communities, and in this case uh, uh, the answer for Israel, is increased desalination. But that's all uh, available only for rich countries. Um, and of course that leads to the burning of more fossil fuels because it's all um, uh, involving burning of either gas, coal or oil. Um, that leads to greater air pollution and increased uh, CO2 emissions. This issue of climate change is finally an issue that you can't blame at, at least um, the Eastern Mediterranean countries for uh, uh, world conflict. Um, this is an issue that leadership is required from you, from you here. Um, uh, this is an, e an issue that scares Israelis and Palestinians and Jordanians together. Just last weekend for the 350 event, Jordanian uh, youth did the number three on their shores of the Dead Sea. Palestinian youth did the number five on their shores of the Dead Sea. And Israeli youth, the number zero. And aerial photography combined it all to 350. Um, you might have seen it on CNN. Um, so it uh, has led to some level of cooperation, but largely, at least the non-oil producing part of the Middle East, is not to blame and can't do anything about uh, the implications of climate change. It's up to you. And uh, that's why uh, Copenhagen and post-Copenhagen is so crucial that uh, leadership uh, be shown by the developing states and by some of the uh, large uh, uh, underdeveloped states. Thank you. And thank you very much. Vince, take it away. Thank you. Um, when Dan asked me to speak and speak on behalf of Asia, I felt like, wait a minute, I should have probably a Chinese on one side and an Indian on the other side to back me up uh, to represent Asia. But uh, what I'd like to do is maybe talk about first how it impacts uh, climate change as an issue as far as the Philippines, and then I want to go on a Google Earth view of where things stand on the road to Copenhagen. Um, you probably have read all the newspaper art, uh, stories about the massive typhoons we've had in the Philippines lately, and that was really as an outcome of a very unusually hot summer early this year, which has bred these super typhoons in the Western Pacific, and now they're just roaring down the typhoon alley of, towards the Philippines, uh, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. Um, that has brought the issue of climate change to the forefront of each and every Filipino. When uh, WWF Philippines in, in early this year was debating how do we bring the topic of climate change to the, uh, to the public, we were very cautious in coming up with predictions from sea level rise of maybe two meters, four meters. Uh, we didn't want to scare the public, but when these uh, super typhoons just passed through in September and October, we saw rainfall of two meters in a week. Uh, where we saw flood uh, waters rise by uh, 8 to 10 meters in, in less than 24 hours. So uh, immediately, climate change um, uh, is in the forefront of every Filipino uh, consciousness. Uh, about a week or two ago, the president of World Wildlife Fund, uh, uh, Jim Leap, came to the Philippines and we called on the president on how um, should we somewhat make Copenhagen uh, more of a success and less of a failure. Um, I actually off, off the belief of as Dan that I think we're not going to expect much uh, this December. Um, but nonetheless, you, you don't give up uh, and you go for a fighting chance till the last second. So we spoke to the president, President Arroyo, uh, my former boss, and uh, she said to us, uh, wait, wait a minute, the Philippines, we're not an issue here. We're a climate taker, not a climate maker. Uh, the Philippines has passed some 
very progressive biofuels law requiring blending of biofuels in our diesel and gasoline. Last year we passed a landmark renewable energy law that requires uh, feed-in tariffs and renewable portfolio standards to increase our level of renewable power mix, which currently today is about 34 percent of our power is from renewable, which is actually not bad compared to our neighboring c countries that are oil exporting countries. So we're actually there already in the forefront and certainly we want to see a climate treaty by December this year, but the Philippines is not a deal maker. We are not uh, a pivotal uh, decision a voice in Copenhagen. And that's where I want to now lead you to a slide that um, I like to show you. Uh, Sasha knows me that uh, every time I've been here as a world fellow, I always have a PowerPoint presentation. But I have one slide if I could just ask my panelists to look and, ter um, and turn around and um, show you a slide, uh, if I may, of a WWF view of the world as far as perhaps sometime in October of the likelihood of where we see a climate treaty. I like this slide because one, I'm speaking in a university uh, environment, so we all love these matrices. And this is a slide on one axis, um, uh, you have what we call more supportive. In other words, they're in favor of uh, a climate treaty. And down the other axis, uh, in this, uh, in the, uh, down below, you have perhaps what we call less supportive of a climate treaty. The horizontal axis talks about less powerful states, um, the alliance of small island states on the leftmost corner, countries like the Maldives, which I'm sure you read recently has had a cabinet meeting underwater uh, to drive the point of uh, sea level rise, or the Scandinavian, what we call uh, climate leaders, Africa, the progressive G77, of which the Philippines is part of, and then on the other side, on the upper right, of course, is what we call the progressive EU led by Germany uh, that Sasha has talked about. We have what we call in this sort of purple bubble, what we call the core deal makers. A climate treaty cannot happen without the role of the EU, China, Japan, India, and the US. As illustrated by this scholar. But recent pronunciations have shown that there's some movement in this map. Now you see EU, Sasha, perhaps being less supportive of climate change. Now you'll argue with me, that's not true, that Germany is gonna speak loud in uh, Washington DC, but because of the global financial crisis, there is some concern perhaps from Italy that maybe we shouldn't be as aggressive in the reduction that we will mandate in the post-Kyoto uh, protocol. So we see slight uh, dropping of support from the EU. With the Obama election, of course, we now see a more support coming from uh, the United States, and I think it's a question of timing. I think there's a question of way too much on the agenda, the legislative agenda, whether it's healthcare, Afghanistan or the climate treaty. And with the recent election of uh, Hatoyama, the Prime Minister of Japan, I think he's come out perhaps a little bit ahead of his electorate in being more pro uh, towards the climate treaty here. And, oops, excuse me, did I just accidentally go backwards, I didn't mean that. Uh, he just got recently elected, uh, he'll be around. And I think recent propagations from India seems to signal that they're now willing to actually look at some form of, uh, but with a lot of preconditions, a lot of negotiating uh, maxima, maxima minima uh, stance. And, oops, and, and, and I think the question here is we, cannot reach a deal without the United States. That is absolutely the fact of life. And as Sasha mentioned, the next important meeting of leaders is the APEC summit in November 14, 16. It's in Singapore. The US will be there, Australia will be there, China will be there, Mexico, Russia. And our message 
to our president, President Arroyo, uh, when we called on her uh, actually last Sunday, is that the, the members of APEC need to speak loud, and we have only one audience, President Obama, that we are behind, we're moving into this, so that when he comes back mid-November, hopefully there'll be some movement, maybe that's wishful thinking in the legislative. We think he has three-fourths of Congress behind him, half lower house and half of the Senate, the Democratic side. But I think with a 60, uh, 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 60 votes in the uh, uh, Democrats, I think that's not something that could be taken for granted because we have to have the moderate Democrats in buying into this. Um, there's been some talk that perhaps the India and China might prepare to have a regional treaty. Uh, there was some talk last week about China uh, and India coming, signing a regional MOU. I think that's all just negotiating posture leading up to Copenhagen. And I think the key question is whether or not we're gonna have representation on the head of state level in Copenhagen. Are they gonna show up? We know that President Obama went all the way to, was it Copenhagen for the Olympics? And kinda exposed himself perhaps uh, uh, that Chicago didn't quite make it in the first round to the uh, uh, Olympic venue and maybe now he has to think twice. But I think unless he goes, we're not gonna find a deal. So I think I wanna end my little contribution and leave it to a Q&A. Thank you Thank Vince you. for a very vivid demonstration of the complexity here. All right, it's your opportunity to add your perspective or ask a question, starting in the back. Russia, Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa, they're all federal countries. And you all talk as if we lived in this realist world of essentially sort of these, uh, these unitary states. And what we miss here is that this is not a collective action problem at a realist national level. That the countries are the key, key deal, play, uh, deal breakers and deal makers here, all countries with strong subnational governments, some of which are among the most progressive in the world with regards to climate regulation, some of which are the most sort of behind with regards to climate regulation. And so I think as long as we keep thinking of the world in terms of 192 states that can somehow sign a deal, where we all know that in the United States, the federal government has relatively little leeway without getting the states on board, we're not gonna be getting far. And so I'm not sure whether the level of discussion that we're having on the panel is really gonna help us solve the fundamental collective action dynamics that I'd work here. Anyone wanna comment? Well, uh, just, just for the sake of the discussion, I think this is actually not true, what you're saying. Uh, there is obviously a big difference in the US between, well, the level of emissions, also the level of policy in California, uh, as opposed to, let's say, Texas. And uh, I don't wanna pick on Texas, I could pick other states too, but, uh, yeah, the, the, the key policy framework is being set in Washington, both domestically but especially for issues like international cooperation. And uh, uh, the, uh, that is what we had, did experience in the last eight years. That uh, there was, uh, well, everyone was obviously focusing on uh, what was happening in the States, even international cooperation was happening was focusing on that kind of thing. Germany's foreign minister was traveling uh, to California visiting Mr. Schwarzenegger because there was no one in Washington to talk to. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, those things don't really, well, change the game. And the game-changing decisions have to be made in the national capitals in Washington and in Moscow and in Beijing. It's also not the case for Australia. Although it's a federation, it's the federal government that signs international treaties and can make the commitment. It's not reliant, it's not like the US system of uh, depending on uh, the states. So it does differ from place to place and that's not the case also in Australia. Although I, I think th in defense of the question, um, in the United States it's not that the states can themselves fix the problem uh, on their own, they won't, they can't. Um, but the political dynamic which means they send certain senators to Washington who are not disposed toward a treaty uh, is the fundamental issue here. 
And Vince, um, all that good wishing uh, for Obama won't get us very far if, uh, if we are at 59 votes in the Senate. And you point out there are 60 Democrats, but let's subtract 18 coal state Democrats from that total and then start counting up again. Right. And that's the political difficulty, I think. Uh, very tough to get that math to work. Uh, another question, comment, please. There's a microphone coming, and if you can hold just one second, we'll make sure to record you for posterity. Uh, thank you very much for coming here today. And I'd like to, what it is that has been going on in my mind is the fact is, is that all of the numbers that we're talking about, the money that's going to be paying for the, uh, the renewable energy, the uh, cap and trade, it's all based upon how it is that we were able to fund and buy our way into this problem in the beginning. So how do we propose looking in the, into the future, the economies and how it is that we will buy our way out of this predicament that we have? Because we can't be buying stuff, producing stuff the way that we have in the, fa in the past. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that I've got a, I don't know that I've got a, Definitive. I certainly don't have a definitive answer to that. But what I would say is, is, is I. You take Nick Stern's report in 2007, suggesting that 450 billion U.S. dollars of, of spend, one percent of global GDP, could go some way towards, you know, carbon proofing the planet, and the amount of rigor and cross-examination that's been put in, in, in his direction, and the amount of questioning that's gone on as, as to as to where that money would come from. And you then contrast that with the kind of back of the envelope, let's, let's rescue everyone we possibly can, bankers and automotive companies and that sort of thing, slightly willy-nilly with, with arguably not anywhere near the same level of due diligence applied to the tune of perhaps 10.8 10, 10 trillion. I think the BBC reported the other day that the total cost of recession-busting measures is a global figure, and you can question these figures, but the order of magnitude, I think, speaks for itself you know, 20 times the kind of spend that Nick Stern was, was recommending we spend to try and, to try and mitigate. And um, it leaves you a little bit cold, no pun intended, um, that, 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 that one set of values get, gets applied to one side of the equation and a completely different one gets applied to the other. And just to add to that, there is the uh, $800 billion worth of potential revenue from the sale of the uh, permits that the United States be, will be putting in play. Um, one can question whether the uh, existing legislative proposals that give 80 plus percent of that away uh, without auctioning it are, are in fact the right strategy, recognizing that there will be substantial investments required to make a, a different energy future succeed. Um, other questions, comments? Yeah, way over on the side. Hi. Um, I think one of the issues that maybe negotiators are dealing with now is the question of what legal form um, the, the whatever deal in Copenhagen um, takes. You know, is it going to be a treaty kind of like the Kyoto Protocol that has to go back and be ratified, or could it be maybe something else, maybe a COP decision that is different um, and would not have to go back and be ratified? And I wonder, you know, maybe you could talk about uh, the pros and cons of um, those different options. And maybe I'd be interested also in how it would play in Washington if whatever deal didn't have to go back and get ratified. Okay. Sasha. Well, the thing is, it has to be a legally binding treaty. And uh, for the simple reason that uh, everything else will just uh, not consider to be binding and people will just not trust the other countries that they do what they claim they do if it's not legally binding. And uh, uh, one of the problems that we're having in those negotiations is that there is a lot of mistrust because, well, when you go back to Kyoto, there is, uh, well, not all developed countries ratified the Kyoto Protocol, mm -hmm. although they signed it. Not all the countries that ratified the Kyoto pro uh, Protocol well, uh, well it achieved uh, the commitments they undertook, and uh, the, uh, anything that is not legally binding will just not cut it, because this is, uh, otherwise it will just be another of those non-binding declarations that you have in a lot of, a lot of uh, areas of international law, well, uh, like declarations the Human Rights Council passes that no one, no one cares about. So we need a legally binding agreement. It's an interesting question whether we need exactly the same we had, uh, we had in Kyoto, probably not. The U.S. has made clear they have a different kind of setting. They probably also show a way of the word because it carries high negative symbolism in certain circles in this country. 
but it's also clear that the, uh, some of the political deals made in Kyoto are unavoidable, that there is a differentiation, for example, between the commitments of developed and developing countries, also that the legal character of the commitments for developed countries is different than the one for developing countries, and that kind of things. And for some issues, for example, for things like emission trading or the clean development mechanism, but everywhere where commodities are shifted back and forth that are worth money, you need a legal framework because otherwise you do not guarantee uh, the, the economic uh, worth of those assets. And here's the, the guy who's an expert in that and making a lot of money with that. I can only talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I've not found a way to become rich. <laughs> no, you need, you need legally binding to make it stick. That's, and it's, that means it's going to be years, even if, you know, we're lucky so an agreement is made in December. It probably it will take several years before everyone it becomes. I think Kyoto Protocol only became effective early 2005. Yeah. So it's going to be years after that before it even becomes effective. Another question right here. Really quickly, I think um, her question was also talking about um, it being the COP decision as possibly uh, being an alternate mechanism for actually getting a treaty passed. Um, given that I'm, I hear the word legally binding tossed around a lot, but I'm not really sure that I understand what it means. I mean, with Kyoto, if people who didn't, like Canada, if people who didn't actually do what they were supposed to do, if there's no mechanism for penalizing them, then, you know, even if Kyoto is our paragon of legal bindingness, what does that mean? And what would it mean in, you know, in, in this uh, sort of post-2012 regime, even if we had something like Kyoto, if we had no compliance mechanism? You want me to answer as a law professor? You're all yes. looking this way. Um, I think you're going to have to take several law courses to get the full level of detail necessary to think this through. <laughs> um, so I, I won't try to give a, a, a definitive answer except to say uh, that international law is a much softer law than domestic law. There is no structure of police force out there to take countries uh, uh, to the dock if they don't fulfill their obligations. And it's a much, it requires a much greater level of creativity to really set up a structure that uh, convinces people that they should adhere to whatever commitments they've made because it's in effect, uh, while not fully you know, binding on them, uh, you, know, you have to convince them rather than harass them into uh, fulfilling their obligations. And uh, you know, there is just one other nuance here which uh, those who watch the US process should um, just be aware of. And that is if it's in the form of a treaty, it actually takes 67 votes in the Senate to get adopted. So watch, I think, for the US to try and get this in the structure uh, of an executive legislative agreement that requires only a majority vote of both the House and the Senate as opposed to 67 votes in just the Senate. Um, but I do think with the rest of the panel that it's very hard to get the kind of financial commitment behind the effort without there being true legally binding obligations in the strongest possible sense that it's available in international law. And that's why I think um, we have to anticipate that there won't be some observation of the parties uh, or alternative uh, decision taken in Copenhagen but rather a delay leading to a, a full-blown agreement at some point down the line. Uh, I think, by the way, it is uncertain whether it'll even get done in the six to 12 months that Sasha is hoping for, because once the Obama administration uh, comes back from Copenhagen uh, and once they have their health care proposal through, despite the that very uh, significant hopes of the environmental community that that means climate change is teed up next, it will not be. Um, the, new ad the administration's uh, agenda going into the new year will center on jobs uh, and uh, trying to ensure a better economic picture going into the midterm November 2010 elections. Uh, so I think this is going to take you know, many months, uh, all of 2010 uh, more or less, and quite probably spilling over to 2011 to get the U.S. Uh, in a position to uh, step up and commit to real action domestically that is the necessary foundation on which an international agreement gets made. And I think the consensus around the need to get the U.S. locked down domestically is quite strong here, quite striking. Please. Here in the U.S., sorry, thank you. Uh, we've seen a lot of movement here in the U.S. Uh, with the uh, 
uh, many corporations and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which has been kind of interesting. And there's a lot of discussion uh, prior to Copenhagen about um, policy mechanisms and governments. Is there any value in the committee of people who are working on this to try to bring global corporations and even in-state corporations to take a side and to get them to align themselves one way or the other regarding uh, climate change. In fact, they tend to be the ones that are influencing our senators, uh, our, our legislative bodies, and perhaps really pushing the corporate community, um, not just people who are in alternative energy, for instance, but businesses hate uncertainty, and a lot of corporations, I would think, would like to see some of this ratified. Any of you want to talk about the corporate role here? Not particularly, no. no so <laughs> really all, I, mean, I can. Well, in fact, the corporate role is really uh, on the domestic level. I think this is the point uh, the, uh, the business sector has to make in a country like the, uh, like the US, um, that uh, whatever the decision is, uh, there, there needs to make a decision on the future framework, the f future framework on the emission regime. Um, and uh, internationally, I do not necessarily think if there is a business leaders council in parallel to Copenhagen, to the Copenhagen summit A, that anyone will pay attention because people will pay attention to what governments are talking about. This is also the place for governments. But on the national level, without support of business for a change in, well, basically managing the energy sector, nothing will happen. And I, and I do think in the domestic U.S. situation, you have a number of companies that have stepped up, uh, some of them in a structured way through the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, to say that the time for binding commitments has come. Uh, this, by the way, is a stark contrast to uh, a, a good bit of the last 20 years' history in this field. When I was negotiating the Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992, I went all around the country looking for companies that would step up and say, time to do a deal, should get going on climate change. And outside of a few alternative energy companies, uh, very tough going. The only big company in the world, uh, uh, only big company in the U.S. that was willing to say anything positive about the prospect of addressing climate change uh, was Enron, uh, which, as we know, <laughs> did not come to a good end, uh, nor did the leader who was willing to talk, uh, Ken Lay. So uh, we have come a, a good distance in this country, and I think that does make the politics uh, easier because you've got a business community that is um, I think uh, one could argue uh, divided, but probably leaning towards predictability and wanting uh, a, a clear path forward. Can I, can I just say something oh, yeah, very, very quickly? Yeah. It's probably not specifically answering your question, but it does highlight the idea of the, the need for some sort of institutional continuity between policy level directives and, and what actually happens on the ground. And, and what I was saying about, I mean, what I think is one of the biggest stumbling blocks for, for Copenhagen really is for the developing countries to take countries like the UK, I'm not on a UK bashing mission here, but to take them seriously when in 2007 they have an energy security white paper that says, you know, one of the key goals for the next few years is to maximize, um, you know, oil and gas production from the North Sea for our energy security. And yet on the other side of the coin you have this, um, this statement about trying to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. And the same thing applies uh, at, at a, a policy level when compared to the actual actions of industry on the ground. And until you have some sort of real institutional consistency, rather than just um, politicians making noises, you're not really going to get proper uptake from developing countries. Question in the back. Great. Well, as you were just noting, uh, there are hugely divergent interests between developing nations and developed nations today. So what are the prospects, you think, of trying to maybe have two levels of negotiations between these two sets of countries? And as a corollary to that, what kinds of concessions and sort of technology transfers or whatever do developed countries need to make uh, to get developed con uh, developing nations on board? Well, I, think, I think one thing that needs to happen is there needs to be an acceptance uh, on the part of developed countries that developing countries need to emit a certain amount of carbon to lift um, their populations out of a situation of, say, poverty. So in the case of India, uh, an idea that's been tabled is that uh, they require a kind of an allowance of perhaps two tons per head for each person that's on below the poverty line. Uh, it's what they call the can't avoid uh, scenario. They're saying, look, you know, we, we want to stick to these, um, these carbon limits, but we, we are duty-bound to develop our economy to bring these people out of a situation of rural poverty. Help us out here. 
And the figure that's being tabled is two tons per, per person who's on less than $1.25 US a day. And I think that's a sort of a, a reasonable stance. You can take it all the way through to the extreme version of that, uh, of that situation. We're under kind of strict liability. Africa feels it owes virtually nothing. In fact, it should be being compensated for um, the, the drought situations and the climate change that they're experiencing as a result of developed countries having, having enjoyed 250 years of development. And, um, you know, I don't have a particular position on that. But I do think there needs to be some acceptance of this can't avoid uh, scenario there and, and an allowance made. Vince, I I guess, uh, uh, Vince <coughs> want to add something? Well, well uh, uh, it's, that's the point of India, which is sort of allow us to have uh, so much emission per capita. China looks at it slightly differently, allow us to grow as an economy, but we're willing to reduce the growth of emission below the economic growth. So you've got two different models. One is a emission per capita for the engine position, and the Chinese position is that, okay, we'll support this climate treaty, but we'll grow, don't cap us, but we'll grow, but lower than our economic growth. So, and again, you need both countries to make a deal stick. Globally. Sasha. And uh, by the way, the reason behind this is that the average Chinese emissions, uh, per capita emissions, happen to be exactly the average uh, emissions on a planetary scale. So uh, China has nothing to grow anymore. India has. And uh, that leads me to the point. I, I don't think it makes sense anymore to talk about developing countries because they are very different countries with very, very different starting points and very different interests. They're the African countries are interested in adaptation only, and their emissions are not. Uh, significant at all. There are uh, some countries who have specific interests when it comes to forests, the tropical forest countries in the Congo basins, uh, the Amazon basins, uh, Southeast Asia. And then there are uh, the, the what is being classically perceived as developing countries, India, China, and the like, which are very different. In China, for example, the average emission of a of an inhabitant of Beijing or Shanghai is uh, at the same per capita level as the average emission of an inhabitant of Paris or Berlin. Uh, the overall emissions of China are different because there are big regional differences. So uh, that, that is also that, uh, something that has, has to be taken into account. In fact, one of the most damaging things in uh, international uh, negotiations, not only in the climate area, but in the trade area, in human rights and so on, is that uh, this artificial separation between developed and developing countries and this grouping of G77 that uh, aggregates countries that are extremely different from Burkina Faso to Singapore under this, uh, this heading of developing countries. And it's uh, perfectly understandable why this uh, uh, this is still being kept up. There are political interests, especially of the richer developing countries, to be treated like, uh, like poor countries, meaning with soft clothes, but it's not productive anymore. And by the way, uh, there, there are two conversations taken, taken place, or have to take place at the APEC country. The one is the one to Mr. Obama, basically telling him, you have a certain responsibility here, however difficult your situation at home might be. But the other also has to take place probably between the Europeans and the big emerging economies to tell them, well, it's all, all well and fine that there is a differentiation between developed and developing countries, but you are not that underdeveloped as you were 15 years ago. So just to add on that, the, the question premised, what is the developed world going to do for the developing world? And I would say it's an equally important question flowing the other way, as Sasha is suggesting. Um, and in the U.S. political dynamic, I promise you there is no deal at any point ever unless the major developing countries have committed to binding emissions controls. And as Sasha said, it doesn't mean that they're going to go down, uh, but they have to commit to a reduced trajectory of growth. And uh, that is fundamental to getting anything close to a majority in the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. So we are going to have to see a revitalization of the principle that's been at the heart of every past global environmental cooperation effort, uh, the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. Common meaning every country signs up, no one sitting on the sidelines, no one to use the economics term free riding. Uh, differentiated responsibility meaning that there'll be quite a wide variation between what Burkina Faso is asked to do, uh, what Beijing is asked to do, uh, and what the US or Europe would be asked to do. Another question? Yes, right here. So, uh, 
Uh, I think uh, all the leaders in the world, they are, they are willing to take the lead to help with the global climate change. But why they don't do it is because every country has its own difficulties. Say a lot of countries don't have very good financial mechanism to trade an emission permit. So I think maybe um, uh, if we, we still focusing on that, the problems are not going to be safe, solved. So I want to raise a question on the forage side. Uh, I want to know, uh, maybe this question goes especially to Vincent, how much do you think the developed countries are willing to pay for, for countries in the tropical region to refer, uh, for reforestation? Thank you. Uh, how much are developing countries willing or to pay? Developed countries. Oh, developed. Yeah. Oh. Like how oh. much U.S. will be willing to pay for reforestation in Amazon or in Philippines? I, I don't have a number for that, uh, unless some of you do. So we'll actually, I think we put this to Sasha, because it's the European Union that's obstructing the bringing of forestry into the next agreement. Uh, the U.S. is certainly ready to do it. We've got other issues. We're not so ready to move on. But forest is not the, the stumbling block from the U.S., but the European Union is. So I was glad to hear you say forestry is critical to the next agreement, but that's not the official position out of Brussels. Oh, then... That's, uh, that's actually not true what you're saying, but uh, <laughs> it's um, what the EU has been saying, the EU uh, is in favor of including uh, forests into uh, a future regime. Uh, the EU is hesitant to use the carbon market to finance uh, forest, uh, uh, tropical forest uh, re deforestation reduction. And uh, the reason behind that is that there is a certain suspicion against, well, well European or North American countries buying cheap tropical forest carbon offsets in developing countries and by their, uh, thereby depressing the carbon price uh, and thereby, well, creating havoc to the European carbon market. So this is the reason behind it. There is also, well, I think this uh, mistrust towards market-based mechanism has also grown as a consequence of the financial crisis where everyone has learned that there are a lot of financial products out there that we don't fully understand. We do not necessarily want to create new ones. Uh, and in fact, my organization has, has been a little bit more optimistic about the role of forest carbon, but the EU supports um, the inclusion of uh, forests into a regime and has in fact uh, uh, already uh, announced, uh, well, well, not announced, but the European Commission has already proposed a significant chunk of money for the next years, for the interim phase. Uh, Vince has already mentioned even if we get an agreement in the next one to two years, there will be a ratification period. So for the next five years or so, we also need something. We also need some interim financial mechanism to support, well, capacity building, technology transfer, climate change adaptation, and tropical, tropical deforestation. And that all has to come from public households. So uh, uh, the EU, in a way, has a mechanism to generate that money through uh, uh, auctioning to part of the auction revenue from the emission trading system. I hope the U.S. system will also foresee that. This is, I by think the we've way, given all the permits away. Hmm? I think that all the permits have been given away to the coal interests. Okay. Here? Yeah. Yeah, I actually also fear that will happen. I had a conversation. I'm just mentioning that because this is your job to do, to take care of in the next weeks and months. I had a conversation last week in Washington with someone that you know well who was pretty high up in the, I'll tell you later, <laughs> <laughs> was pretty high up in the Republican Party hierarchy and who, who basically told me there will be a deal on cap and trade with moderate Republicans. And the deal is the following. Three things will have to happen. Subsidies for nuclear, subsidies for the agricultural sector, and no auctioning in the first years of the cap and trade system. And if this is the deal, it's not a good deal, especially not the latter because... Uh, uh, so to my knowledge, the U.S. has a significant household deficit, and I don't think that those financial transfers will paid, uh, be paid out of uh, the general budget. We need some new sources of financing. The only one I see is the carbon market. Good point. Here. I'm wondering if you all think that uh, Copenhagen should really just be focusing on reduction of carbon emissions, or if there's any place in the discussion we're talking about adapting to um, negative effects of climate change actually happening. Well, I think the, the, the new buzzword now is adaptation is for now, mitigation is for the future. And for a lot of those countries that are vulnerable, 
adaptation is important. So uh, um, I think you're, you're still going to see adaptation as part of the, um, the, the, the agreement and not just mitigation. Yeah, and particularly for the less developed countries, that's clearly a priority that, that financing for adaptation be integrated into any agreement that comes out. That's the, the, the major demand of the uh, developing countries. Um, I, I would like to highlight, while we talk about you know, the responsibility of the states, be it uh, national or federal, um, how about the, the responsibility of us as individuals? And are we really doing enough in the choices that we make when uh, using our purchasing power, um, uh, in raising our voice? At the 350 event in Washington, D.C., uh, on Saturday, there were maybe 250 people. In Brooklyn Bridge, there were 400 people. That's not a very uh, loud voice. That's not a very effective way of telling members of Congress here in the U.S. that this is an issue that the American public is worried about. Well, I'm afraid we are out of time, but please join me in thanking our speakers, and then we will uh, continue the conversation more informally outside. <laughs>